Well, hello, good morning, welcome back to another virtual visit live from the Alaska Sea Life Center. As always, my name is Alex, and uh, well, we're going to take a look at the sunrise right away, because it was gorgeous this morning, uh, and our sunrise, you know, every once in a while in the winter, we get this real nice alpen glow, so this one was a good one. Uh, I know some folks from the education staff went, uh, and they... Uh, put on their jackets, they went back outside into the snow there, and they looked at that sunrise. We'll let it loop through one more time here, because it was pretty quick. But you can see that nice alpen glow that we get on our mountains here. So here it comes up and over. Now, I have been doing the time lapses at the same time every day for all of these programs, about 8.30 to 10.30. Uh, pretty soon, I think we're going to get to where we're just going to miss the actual sunrise, but I'll still try to get a camera out there for that. And that is, of course, because our days are getting longer here. The sun is rising earlier. Um, today, I don't know, it came about, I think we're about like 9.15, 9.16 nowadays on the sunrise. Uh, and, of course, with our mountains, it delays it a little bit uh, as it comes up over the mountains. And then, you know, it makes that sun set a little earlier as well as it drops behind the mountains right next to us. Now, I am, uh, you know, getting ready to show you an area of the sea life center we don't normally see. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout this entire program, want to get that in there early, make sure you type those in the chat or make sure you, uh, you, know, you can text them on that text number down below. But before we get started on that, we always want to thank our sponsors for these programs. Uh, and this season of uh, virtual visits has been sponsored by Royal Caribbean Group. And fortunately, with their sponsorship, we've been able to make these just free uh, to the public. You, know, you can tune in on Wednesday at 11 a.m. and come visit the Alaska Sea Life Center virtually. So as I mentioned, we're kind of, we're at like a strange area. I don't know that we've done a virtual visit from this area before. We might have done it once before, uh, but you can kind of see behind me some, some odd pens over there. We're going to talk about what all of those are, uh, but today we're going to be going back behind the scenes, and we're actually going to see uh, not just these pens, what are the pens, but we're going to see kind of a whole area of the center uh, that the public typically doesn't. You know, we do offer some little tours back there here and then, uh, but we're going to kind of take a look at a section of the center where a lot of the work that makes this place happen uh, takes place. You know, we're going to see maybe some vet stuff. We're going to see some where's the food come from. So some of these might look like parts we've seen from other episodes as well. And we'll usually call that out if that's the case. So if you are interested in this, type in chat. But also we'll call out other episodes of virtual visits you'll be able to check out to learn more about this uh, behind the scenes area. So with that... We're going to jump on into the clip. All right. Well, today we're going to be going behind the scenes here at the Sea Life Center. And for anyone that's ever visited us, or maybe you've seen it in uh, the background of a couple of our other virtual visits, we've got these big blue doors everywhere around the center, and most of them lead back into staff areas. So today we're going to take a look at one of the most traveled areas behind the scenes. Come on in. So this right here is the receiving area. Now, what are we receiving? We're receiving a lot of food, usually. And that leads into our big walk-in freezer right back here. Uh, and this is actually one side of it. We can load it from this side. And the other side is our food prep kitchen, which you might have seen in another program. But we'll be taking a look at that again in just a moment. Another thing that we've got here right back behind me is a door uh, with a biohazard symbol. That leads back into our wildlife response program. You might have seen our earlier virtual visits with our Wildlife Response Program. This program responds to wild animals in need of care, such as injured or sick animals or unweaned juveniles that have been separated from their mothers. Each year, our Wildlife Response staff receives calls about potential animals in need through our hotline and either responds in person or works with partners around the state to determine the best course of action. Occasionally, these response cases are just down the road from the Sea Life Center, but Alaska has a ton of coastline, more than the rest of the United States combined, and chances are good that the animal will need to be transported over long distances. This most likely involves moving the animal on the highway, perhaps in our wildlife response van, but it can also involve boats and aircraft, sometimes even a combination of all three. Responding to the call is just the beginning of a long process of care for most of our wild patients. Depending on the age, health, and overall releasable status of an animal, any given patient may be here for quite a long time. If an animal is not releasable back into the wild, it will either stay here at the Alaska Sea Life Center 
or we will arrange for permanent care at a similar facility. For patients that are deemed releasable, however, our wildlife response staff will arrange to transport the animal back to its usual range and release it back out into the wild. Let's head on down this hallway here. All right, so we just saw the walk-in freezer for our food prep kitchen, and here is that food prep kitchen. Now, one of the most essential tasks at the Sea Life Center revolves around one thing, and that one thing is food. The Alaska Sea Life Center receives about 100,000 pounds of frozen seafood every year, including salmon, herring, capelin, pollock, krill, crab, squid, and other mollusks and it is stored in this giant walk-in freezer. As you saw at the start of this walkthrough, the freezer is accessible from both sides, and this makes it much easier when loading in the pallets of fish. Food is then taken as needed from the freezer and thawed before we feed it to our animals. All of our husbandry departments use the food prep area to prepare food in some manner. For example, our marine mammal staff comes in quite early every morning to inspect and prep fish, making sure they are all up to standards. The entire process of sorting fish, cutting up fish, preparing buckets for every seal and sea lion, and cleaning up takes roughly an hour. Each of our mammals has their own bucket, which holds their food for the day, and this makes giving our mammals medicine a bit easier as well, since pills can be hidden in the gills of fish, and those fish can be placed into the corresponding bucket, and this helps out our vet staff as well. Due to the variety of species and sizes of mammals, there is a pretty wide spread of the amount of food that might go into each bucket. Some of our animals may need over 50 pounds of food a day, or less than 10 pounds, or anywhere in between, depending on the species, age, and the time of year. Our aquarium department is heavily reliant on krill, squid, and small fish like silver sides when it comes to feeding our over 2,000 fish and invertebrates. Our aquarists prepare the food in the same Tupperware you may have in your own home. However, yours probably does not hold a couple pounds of krill. Our avian staff takes food from our food prep freezer, but they typically prepare said food up in the curatorial area behind the aviary. Be sure to check out one of our previous virtual visits where we went back behind the scenes and on the rocks in the aviary with one of our aviculturists and learned all about how we provide food for our birds. Let's keep going with our walkthrough. All right, so continuing on down the hall, kind of on each side of us, there's different areas in this building for research, for our science, or for support. This right here is actually our veterinary clinic. As the name suggests, this is our in-house vet clinic that provides medical care to all of our animals here at the center. We have a team of veterinarians on staff with someone always on call. Our vet clinic is located on the other side of our wildlife response center, as the two go hand in hand. Animals that come in through our response program typically require some form of medical attention, so the ease of having them connected is ideal. Our vets perform annual checkups on every animal in our care. They may perform surgeries or monitor pregnancies or treat illnesses. Tasks are not too different here in our vet clinic than maybe your vet for your pet at home. Now down this way, we've actually got uh, kind of a, a crossroads here. This way leads to our West Curatorial. West Curatorial is just one of the curatorial areas for our aquarium department and is largely a holding area for animals under the care of our aquarist staff. Here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, that's anything that's not a mammal or a bird and includes everything from fish and octopus to shrimp and anemones. Due to the wide variety of animals that fall under the care of our aquarists, West Curatorial is an equally wide variety of tanks that house said animals. Everything from a 10-foot circular tank down to tiny circulating chrysal tanks for plankton. Animals tend to be held in West Curatorial for one of several reasons. Recently collected animals are held here for a quarantine period before being introduced to exhibits out on the floor just to ensure that they're in good health and not potentially bringing with them any unwanted illness or parasites. Likewise, if an animal that has been in an exhibit on the floor is being treated for an illness or condition or has an injury that needs attention, 
they may be held here for the duration of their treatment. Aquarium animals may also be temporarily housed in a curatorial area if their usual exhibit is undergoing maintenance or being redesigned or relocated. For example, when we rebuilt the Discovery Touch pools here at the center, many of the animals from these pools were temporarily held in curatorial areas. And finally, sometimes an animal is held here if they're just currently too small. West Curatorial typically houses several animals that need to grow a bit larger before we can put them out on a floor exhibit. Small octopuses, some young fish, and juvenile spot prawns are all examples of this particular case. Now I've been noting that West Curatorial is used to hold animals when they're not out on the floor, but there are actually several floor exhibits here in West Curatorial. The access areas for our shelf life and denizens habitats as well as our skates and moon jelly tanks are found here in West Curatorial. The open design of this access makes the maintenance and care of these exhibits easier for our staff. And due to the angles and the reflection of the surface of the water, visitors might never even know that there's an entire curatorial area back here. Finally, West Curatorial is also where we have our setup for hatching brine shrimp. We've done a virtual visit in the past about hatching these tiny critters that serve as food for some of our other animals, so be sure to check out that episode if you haven't already seen it. Now then, let's head back to the hallway. Now right down this way, we've actually got a longer hallway leading to our outdoor lab area. The ODL is our outdoor lab space, where we have several large pools that are typically used to house marine mammals like seals, sea lions, or sea otters, but we have also had the occasional Pacific sleeper shark or beluga whale as well. Currently, these ODLs are being occupied by four of our stellar sea lions. These spaces are ideal for observation as they are viewable not only by our staff at the ground level, but also by the public from up above near our touch pools. If you've ever visited the center, you may have seen this view. Our marine mammal staff can hold training sessions on the deck of the ODL provide enrichment, and observe their behaviors to ensure the safety and well-being of our animals. The ODL extends across more than just these pools, however. It also provides a back area that connects several lab spaces, the outdoor wildlife response areas, and several outdoor pens of eider sea ducks. We'll learn a little more about that in a bit. Now, continuing down, we have more of the uh, research and uh, kind of inspection labs, I suppose you could call them, labs with microscopes, uh, labs for looking at things like tissue samples, blood samples, and in fact, we actually have a tissue storage area uh, right over here. Let's take a look, see what that looks like. How do you store tissue? These freezers may not be as impressively large as the walk-in we saw for food prep, but their capabilities are no less incredible. They keep samples frozen at extremely low temperatures to preserve them until they're looked at in our labs. As you can see, they keep things pretty chilly. And right across the hallway from our tissue storage is our central lab. As the name implies, Central Lab is our centrally located laboratory and it is where our lab technicians analyze data from a variety of samples using instruments including microscopes and centrifuges. Our team analyzes blood samples, fecal samples, and other tissues that are stored in the tissue storage area we just saw. They also run water quality analysis, ensuring that the water in the exhibits we have here at the Sea Life Center is safe for our animals and staff. The importance of having this laboratory on site is essential as we can do a lot more of our time-sensitive lab work in-house without needing to mail out all of our samples to off-site labs. That could take quite a while to process as we're not located in the most accessible area. Now down at the end of this hallway, there's actually one more lab we're gonna take a look at today. This one is pretty cool. So right over my shoulder, we're actually gonna take a look at the Eider Lab where we're looking at our large sea ducks here, the spectacled and the stellar's eiders. The eiders that are worked with through this lab, both spectacled and stellar's, are those same eiders that were visible on the ODL earlier in this walkthrough. We have a third species here at the center as well. Several king eiders can be seen in our aviary. Eiders are not typically seen near the Sea Life Center except occasional brief sightings during the migratory season, 
So having flocks under the care of our staff here has allowed for much greater access to and observation of these species. The spectacled and stellars eiders on the ODL have been part of multiple studies here at the center, ranging from reproductive studies to diet and metabolic studies. These flocks have been kept separate from the other birds up in the aviary as part of that research process. While most of the eiders are out on the ODL at any given time, this lab houses much of the equipment used in their care and study, everything from feed supplies to weighing scales and cleaning equipment. There are also a few pens here in the lab that can be used to house a few individuals if need be. And with that, we're kind of at the end of our hall here. So I'll head out this door, I'll swing back around to the floor, and I'll see you there. All right, and here we are, back out on the floor. And you might recognize now where we are. We're up near our touch pool here, but we're uh, kind of next to the overlook for the ODL, or that outdoor lab space. So I hope you enjoyed that kind of glimpse behind the scenes. Just working, like just all the things you could see walking down one hallway in the Sea Life Center. It's kind of fun to, to be able to walk down that hall and just see all the things off to the sides. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type those in the chat, or you can always text us. We run that number at the beginning of these videos. Uh, and then while we're live as well, we have it down in the description. And I think we've got, looks like Laura's got some questions for us. Uh, how do you get so much food to feed all of those animals? Well, that's a great question. How do we get all the food, <laughs> right? Because you saw when we were in the food prep area, I mean, there were like giant potato sacks filled with fish that they were hauling out of there. Uh, so we get that from uh, basically the same place that you're, you're going to buy any large bulk amount of food. Um, and the, you know, when we get these, we actually have uh, fish processing here in town, in Seward. Uh, and we're able to use some freezer space there and kind of store large, large amounts. We can break off smaller amounts for that for our freezer. Uh, and then as you saw, we'll break it out of our freezer into the fridge or into the different departments. So we work with the actual uh, fish processing plants or the fisheries out there as well. Another question, it looks like? Yeah, and with all that food, is there any type of standards or anything that we make sure that our animals are eating well? Yeah, so someone asked, you know, what standards, right? And we did mention that they are checking that food uh, for standards. And what does that mean when we're feeding it to our animals here at the Sea Life Center? Well, we, we don't want them to get sick, right? So we're looking for any fish that doesn't quite look right. And even something as simple as a fish that has like a scrape or a scratch that cuts down through the skin, that can't be fed uh, to, to certain animals here, right? Out of concern that like bacteria would get down in that little crack. Now, obviously we have animals here that may not be quite so picky. We have, you know, animals that are scavengers that'll just kind of go at dead things anyway in the wild. Uh, but we still want to make sure that what we're feeding them is what we uh, think we're feeding them. In fact, when we, when we talked about uh, the, the food prep, you know, we were looking at like these bags and these totes uh, filled with usually one type of fish, and then they break that out. Well, we do get bycatch sometimes in our food as well. So bycatch are things that are caught alongside whatever it is you're fishing for. And sometimes those show up. So you might be going through something, looking at one type of fish, and all of a sudden, oh, this is a different type of fish that made it in here, we wouldn't want to feed it to them. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever cooked beans, you got dry beans, you kind of look through them before you actually cook them, cook them, because there could be like a little pebble in there or something. It looks kind of like a bean at a quick glance, but you obviously don't want to eat that. So our standards for food, making sure it's the right thing, uh, it's the thing we're supposed to be feeding them, making sure it, it, you know, it's looking right, making sure it is not compromised in some way uh, where bacteria could be down in there. That's great. Another question it looks like? Yeah, Margaret has a question about the eider eggs. Any idea what the researcher are doing with the eider eggs? Oh, so uh, when you saw them swapping those eggs out, we do occasionally hatch eiders uh, under the moms here, but we'll also hatch them out of incubators. Um, and even if, even if we're letting them hatch under the mom, we will swap them uh, with a dummy if we're going to check the health of that egg, uh, check the age and the, the development of that egg. And that, in part, you know, is just to keep mom from really panicking. Like, we'll swap a dummy in there. And they'll kind of be like, yep, that's the right number of eggs that I've got. And you also might have seen in the eider lab there, we do have a bunch of eggs along the back. Those are dummy eggs in the making. So if we have an egg that doesn't hatch, we will still take that at the end of the season. We can blow out the yolk. We can keep that shell and we'll fill it with plaster. And then that provides future dummy eggs. Um, so in that particular clip, they're just swapping in a, a dummy egg for a real egg there. Uh, Read out elementary had the exact same question, so you got Perfect. two questions and one answer. That's a good one. Um, are these eiders accessible to the public? 
All right, so unfortunately, you can't just walk on down there, right? Like these back here, those are actually the, the pens that we saw. You can't just walk on down there as the public. Um, but I did mention we do have eiders out in our aviary, which is our public-facing area with our bird. So we do have those king eiders, which are super cool. They're not in our research flocks downstairs. But we have actually just recently moved up uh, a spectacled eider pair up there, so you get to see them as well. And then we have some programs in-house we're trying to work on where hopefully we can increase the amount of uh, interaction and the amount of, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, interaction is probably the best way to put it, but the, the way that the public can actually interact with these animals because we think they're fantastic animals. You know, we're excited about them. I love talking about them. Uh, but to be able to actually see them in front of you up close, there's nothing really, uh, there's no substitute for that. So another question looks like. Yeah, do you have any animals in your rehab right now? Ooh, in our rehab right now, I do not believe we have any currently. That's not to say we couldn't get one like today. Um, we get calls on that hotline throughout the year, uh, especially for things like you know otters, for example. They don't really have a birthing season, so we can get those kind of you know a, a call about an otter whenever. But something more like you know our seals or sea lions, those have birthing seasons, so we wouldn't expect to be getting calls about really young ones. But we will take adults in as well, uh, you know, assuming that they're entangled or sick or something on a beach uh, where we can get down to them. We'll still go check those animals out. But as far as I'm aware, we don't have anyone in our wildlife response program right now. We have another one about where animals come from. Where do your aquarium animals come from? Oh, aquarium animals. So I mentioned in West Curatorial, we will actually hold animals that we've just collected, right? So what does that mean, collected? Well, our aquarium staff will go out uh, around Resurrection Bay, and they'll do net sayings uh, or along the shore where they'll kind of just walk with a little net to see what's there. If there's anything particularly interesting, maybe something they haven't seen before or something where it's like, oh, we want to know more about this, then that can come back here to the Sea Life Center. And there's other ways as well. You know, we'll go out in the boat sometimes. If we see something up at the surface, we can grab it. Um, or we'll even go diving occasionally. And that would be a fantastic virtual visit in the future, I think is to be able to tag along on a collection dive, because they actually put on all the scuba gear, they'll jump in the water, look around for things, you know, looking down under crevices, nooks and crannies, uh, and we found some really fun things that way. So a couple different ways of collecting, but that's how we get the, the vast majority of our aquarium animals, is just through wild collection. Another question, perhaps? Yeah, and kind of following up with that, like how do you know what you want to collect, and wow. how do you know that you're not taking too many or... Or something else. That's a great question. How do we know, like, well, you, you can have that? So we have permits for all of the animals that we collect. Uh, we are given permits that say, yes, you can have this animal. No, you can't have that animal. Or sometimes, like, you can have this animal from this area because there's enough of them in that area, but you can't go collect from that area because that area is a recovering population. So that's all dictated in our permits as to whether or not we can collect. There's some things, you know, that we would love to have. We just don't see them that frequently. Uh, maybe they're you know, out at night or we're not really out doing collections at night um, or something like that. So if we, if we found something where we're like, oh, man, we never see these, but it's, you know, it's not something where we never see them because they're, they're rare <laughs> or uh, they're, they're, they're you know, on our permit, it's like, that's a recovering population. That might be an animal where we're just like, all right, well, we can bring this animal in. Uh, so we do have limits and, um, well, we, we have like catch limits, basically, uh, as well as sort of area limits within our permit. Do any of the animals that you collect on these permits go back out when they're done here, or do they always stay at the sea life center? Ooh, that's a great question. So when we collect aquarium animals, most of those animals, like 99% of them cannot be re-released, right? So that's why we don't want to just go willy-nilly collect everything. We want to collect things that maybe we don't have so many or we don't know a lot about. Because, um, you know, if we just bring everything back here, then they're here, uh, and we'd run out of space. Um, but we, we just don't need to collect everything. So there are actually uh, some instances where we can release out from our, uh, our collection here. And so obviously, you know, wildlife response, that's not part of our collection. So that, res that release is just part of the, the wildlife response. And we could determine whether or not something's releasable or not. But from the aquarium collection, we actually can release out our adult octopus. Uh, and that is because if we get an adult octopus that is sexually mature, ready to reproduce, uh, but maybe we don't have a mate or we're, we're not going to try and breed them or anything, we can actually release that animal back out to where it was collected from uh, just so that for that last chunk of their life where they're trying to uh, bolster their own population, they can hopefully be out there doing that in the wild. That's a great question, though. Any others? 
Yeah, and with all these fish and other invertebrates that come in as part of our collection, do the vets take care of them too? Do the vets take care of the fish, right? Because we talk about the vets, and I think, I think I even said like, oh, it's not dissimilar to the sort of care that your vet might be doing uh, for your pets. But you know, if you have fish, you probably don't take the fish out of the vet. Maybe you do. Maybe you've got a veterinary that actually does work with fish. And our vets here will work with our fish. Uh, you know, if we have a fish that's injured uh, or sick, you saw actually that sign that we'll put. If, if, if someone's recovering in one of those West Curatorial tubs, we'll cover it up. We'll make sure it's nice and quiet and dark in there for them so that they can kind of just relax and hopefully heal up. Um, but our vet team will work with them. And there's actually, this is kind of fun. We mentioned that the animals uh, or the procedures that the vets do aren't dissimilar from what your pets might have. Well, just like you might get a cat or a dog spayed or neutered, we will actually spay fish here at the Sea Life Center. Now, the purpose of us spaying the fish actually isn't just to uh, you know, prevent them from reproducing, like you would do with a, a cat or a dog, although that's obviously a side effect. The reason we'll spay them is because we'll notice that one has become gravid, which is a word meaning she's just filled with eggs. She's ready to lay those eggs but sometimes they won't lay them. It might be that there's an environmental cue that we don't know that they're not receiving. It could be you know, the males in the tank just aren't the right males for her. Um, she doesn't want to lay those eggs. And if those eggs stay in her for too long a period of time, that can cause really bad health complications. Uh, so if we notice a female has been gravid for a concerningly long amount of time, we can actually do a spay on that fish. And so that's a whole operation that our vet team here can do. So the vets do take care of the fish just as uh, alongside those mammals and birds. And maybe that'd be a virtual visit. If it, if it happens in the future that I get word of it, maybe we can sit in on an operation like that or something. Uh, somebody's really excited about summertime. Do people <laughs> ever go swimming in the ODL pool? <laughs> uh, so we saw like the big pool, right? The real big pool has two sea lions in there right now. So we wouldn't want to go swimming in there. Um, we have had divers in there for some little training operations here and there, not while the animals are in it. Um, but no one really goes swimming in there. Uh, you might think, you know, well, how do you clean it, right? Because when we clean the bird habitat or the seals or sea lions, of course, we have to get in there with our scuba gear. And we've done a virtual visit about that. I think it was actually our first virtual visit you can watch about how we clean those large habitats. But those are habitats that we don't want to drain all the way or in some cases can't really drain all the way. For the ODL pools, they'll go through seasonal cleanings where we'll drain them out all the way. We'll get in there, we'll squeegee. Uh, lots of scat, lots of algae at the bottom. It's got to get clean. We'll clean the whole thing, get it spick and span, and then we'll fill it back up with water. So no one's swimming in there to clean them, unfortunately. Uh, or fortunately, I suppose, um, since it's kind of nasty water. All right, looks like maybe we don't have any more questions. I do want to always encourage you, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, oh, I should have asked that question while I had the chance. You can always type it in the comments under this video once it's published. Or you can always email us at asktuffy, that's A-S-K-T-U-F-F-Y, at alaskasealife.org, and we'll be able to get those as well. Um, but we want to thank our sponsors that make these virtual visits possible. So Royal Caribbean Group this year has made this season of virtual visits free to the public. So we are able to tune in, or you're able to tune in, every Wednesday at 11 Alaska time, and we're able to take you to the Sea Life Center virtually, show you around. Just like today, right, we showed you the behind the scenes area that you wouldn't probably even see if you did come visit us here on the floor. So it was real fun to be able to show you that. I hope you had a great time learning about it, and I hope we were able to answer some of the questions you had, and I hope we'll see you again for future virtual visits. So long. <laughs>